This podcast contains potentially adult language, adult themes, definitely drinking, and possibly sexual context. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Drinking with Authors. I'm your host, Erica Lance. My co-host today is Vanessa Valiente. And with us today is the amazing Jody Lynn Nye. Woo! Okay, let's talk about what we're drinking first. So I am I decided to do Angry Orchard Hard Cider because I thought I actually had hot chocolate and I was gonna make that all fun and exciting. And then that's not what I had. So it's it's fine. I got hard cider. Vanessa, what are you drinking? Okay, I have I'm trying to finish out my uh, the dreaming tree crush. So I have my wine. And I have good old some water and some coffee. So I am, I'm prepared for anything that happens. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's amazing. Okay, Jody, you got to wow everybody with your drink. Mm. My hot chocolate. Complete Ooh, with that's a good Very festive. <laughs> and my one cat short of crazy mug. <laughs> In this case, it's three cats. <laughs> Well, I wonder what the exact threshold of becoming a crazy cat lady is. Is there an exact threshold to that? I think it's always one more than you have. <laughs> and then when you have 27, we go, okay, exactly. no, that rule doesn't apply to you. We need. <laughs> well, I know, I know two ladies who foster cats um, and, and a few who almost foster cats. They, they uh, participate in charitable organizations. So... If they don't consider themselves crazy yet, then then who am I to tell them that they are? Mm, totally. Oh, well, I agree with that, especially if they're doing so much good for the world. That's and true. They, they are. They're doing phenomenal work, and it's it's fantastic. That's awesome. Okay, so for those listening who may not know who you are, who are obviously living under mm-hmm. a rock, <laughs> will you talk a little bit about what you write? Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I write uh, mostly science fiction and fantasy uh, books and short stories. I've written quite a lot of them over the years and more more all the time. About 50 books and over 170 short stories. And I've written humorous uh, contemporary fantasy, classic fantasy, um, space opera, humorous space opera, humorous military science fiction, uh, epic fantasy that was that has elements of humor in it. You see a thing developing here. But I've also written uh, shoot 'em up stories. I, I've written a couple of romance stories. I've written a couple of horror stories, which surprised even me. Uh, <laughs> the last thing I turned in, which I'm still very proud of, is a Western, oh, Old West, steampunk, science fiction, humorous short story. Wow! Wow! And it's no, the second awesome. in the second in what I hope will be will be more of them because it was so much fun to do. Wow. No, that's cool. awesome. You, you definitely done like quite a few genres. So it's always nice to see people, you know, kind of play in different sandboxes. Oh, yeah, much. absolutely. Mm-hmm. So we like to go back to the beginning. We, we want to do some teleportation on this podcast. Mm-hmm. When did you start writing? I started telling stories before I could write to my brothers and my cousins. And my, my mother remembered some of them. She wrote them down in my baby book, uh, you know, which most baby books go until you're seven years old. So it's kind of a misnomer. And when I, uh, as soon as I could write, I was making books out of my father's office paper with, uh, his, with his stapler. I was, I was my own publisher and my own illustrator. <laughs> yeah. Way and, more control that way. Way more control. Yes. So I, I've written little bits and pieces of it. My best friend used to say that uh, because I, I would use any kind of paper that I could get a hold of, graph paper, notebook paper, um, reporters' notebooks, the, the skinny, skinny but long kind, those are great for fitting in your pocket or in your purse. So she would she would reach in my back seat and see what I've been working on lately. Oh, wow. So uh, pro- as for professionally published, I uh, published my first short story. Uh, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna get this wrong here. 87, I think. No, it, it, I think it was sooner than that. I was writing um, game fiction for Mayfair Games. Oh, wow. Uh, elements for their, for their modules and for the, uh, they, they published Roll Aids, 
yes, they, they knew exactly how, how funny that was, um, <laughs> which could be played with advanced Dungeons and Dragons, which annoyed oh. TSR because they didn't want anybody using the words and uh, they, they sued and they lost, but that's too bad. And Mayfair also created the Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine game licensed. And I wrote a module based upon Nick Velvet, who was the wonderful thief who never steals anything of value. If you oh. want to commission him to uh, steal a burnt out match or a torn sugar packet, he's your man. But if it's got any value at all, he won't steal it. And that was huge fun coming up with those things. So I was already edging into fiction while I was writing game materials. Then I wrote Choose Your Own Adventures that were licensed in known worlds uh, for tour books, a project that Bill Fawcett, who was then my fiance, fiance and then shortly after my husband had created. So that is awesome. I remember those. Oh, you do? Oh, good. I'm uh, an original gamer from the D&D &D box set. I'm just- I, I am too, yes. You know, I was going to ask you that. I was going to ask if you were a gamer. Oh, that... yeah. yeah. I uh, started uh, playing D&D &D in 1976. I went to my first Gen Con in 77. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. And I was one of oh, about six women there at at that uh, Gen Con, one of only three not named Gygax. Well, so. well, that doesn't surprise me because I started playing when I was about 14, which was in, I could do math here, 87, 88, I started okay. playing, right? Okay. I was 14 years old. Um, it was advanced Dungeons and Dragons by that point in time, but we did have the box set and the dice. And I remember there were girl quote unquote players, but they weren't really players. They were girlfriends of people who brought their girlfriend who had no idea and or interest in playing oh. the original game. You see the group I did play with a few of us girls in it. Yeah, female actual gamers that mm -hmm. were interested and wanted to play the game. And then, and then I used to go to the conventions too when they were in the weird back rooms of hotels or you know in basements and stuff like where they were like this is happening you need to go all the way like way go to where you think you actually are lost and then keep going and you're going to find the gamer yep in other words um you go down a 10 by 10 co uh, foot corridor you you knock on the door and a knoll answers it and says you want the gamers they're three doors down <laughs> exactly Oh my God, so that's awesome. So you're writing modules, short stories. And I think it's interesting because we hear that a lot from people who got into science fiction and fantasy that they were they wrote short stories and modules and stuff before actually branching out into novels, which I don't know is the same way anymore for sci-fi to start as short stories and go to novels. It's, uh, it's less common. It used to be conventional wisdom that you wrote short stories until you were ready to write novels, but they're two different sciences. And some people who write really wonderful short stories cannot hatch a novel. And some people who are natural novelists can't write a short story. Terry Pratchett was one of them. My husband uh, is, is Bill Fawcett. Bill Fawcett and Associates, I am the Ant Associates. <laughs> and he published at least 40 anthologies and we invited Terry every time uh, we had something that would have been suitable for him. And he said, I have tried, but every time I write a short story, it turns into a novel. So there are a few out there, but not enough, just not very many. No, I, I can understand. It's, it's, that I understand it's, it's, just from talking to writers. It's funny because I meet some, um, writers who are like, I'm like, okay, write a short story. It's supposed to be 2,000 or 5,000 words and they turn in something that's 25,000. And I'm like, you're not going to like what the editor does to this. Do you, you maybe want to reapproach? Like it depends on your editor. Uh, I have uh, I used to do a lot of stories for techno books who were doing anthologies for Daw, Bain, and Ace. Mm -hmm. And my wonderful editor, a man named John Helfers, who's currently working for Catalyst Games in Seattle, uh, would send me my stories back because I had come at the word count. And he said, "I can tell this was meant to be longer. Just finish it." It's okay. Oh. He was he was great about that because he would prefer to have the better short story than to absolutely stick to word count. And, and I would be very apologetic because indeed I was. But my husband teases me about it. He says, Jody will write no book before it is long, like the Palma on wines. <laughs> <laughs> I have to ask this question. You're a gamer. What is your favorite class to play? My flavor? Oh, uh, 
elf or half elf almost always. I'm, I'm currently in an online D&D game run by a, a dear friend of mine who has been running it for about 40 years. And people mostly come to his house, but a lot of them were visiting him via Skype and still participating even if they lived a couple of hours or even another state away. Oh, wow. And now, all of us are participating via Skype. Yeah. And I think that's the perfect way to do it uh, because you have the comfort of your own home. We pause occasionally so people can go get something to drink or get rid of something to drink. <laughs> and, uh, then, then when we're done, there's no hour drive to go home. And he's a terrific dungeon master. He's just just great at it. And it's been a, it's been fun. It's been a long time since I was part of a gaming group. I, I was part of a, a short online gaming group, but the uh, the DM had to stop because she was just overcommitted. She was terrific too. Oh wow! But I think it's I think it's wonderful that this is possible. Oh, totally. Well, it's it. We were talking to Dan Wells. I'm sure you know Dan Wells. And he, I played in I played in one of his uh, uh, charity games for charity. Uh, oh my God, when was it? Last October, I think. Oh, yeah, that is awesome. It was um it was Salt Lake City Comic Con. Oh wow, yeah, no, he we talked to we were talking to him. I'm I'm a huge Dan Wells fan too, and he was telling me how he's doing online game mastering, and it's mm -hmm. part of what he's doing during COVID. Yeah. And so I was like, you're what? Okay, signing up. Sign me up right now for the game. And, so even, and even if you can't play, you can jump in and um, and throw a couple of bucks for charity and get um, Fluffy the, the dire poodle, which cracks me up so much, <laughs> <laughs> to do some, some sort of task. That is awesome. What were you going to say, Vanessa? I'm oh sorry. no, I just I'm I it's something I've always wanted to try. So hearing you guys talk about it, like I was so excited when Dan, Dan Wells was telling us that, you know, he does it and Eric was like, "Oh, why don't we just do a whole group with the drinking with authors?" So mm -hmm. I was going to be like the first time I've ever done I don't know if we're doing D&D &D or some other game, but I I'm really excited to kind of try it out. Yeah, I let Dan tell me the games he wants to, to run a dungeon, a DM or GM, I guess, Game Master. And so he listed five games he really wants to play. So we're going to pick one of the ones he really wants to play. And then he was like, if you want to play Dungeons and Dragons, I'll do it. And I'm like, I'm going to pick one of the ones you really are energetic about. You know? <laughs> Like I could write these five stories or I could write about this thing. And you're like, no, I want to pick what you want to write about. Like, yeah, absolutely. That's how it works. So when was your first novel published? So, okay, the, the, it, it gets a little complicated because my first novel is not my first book. Oh, Ooh, okay. I wrote four choose your own adventures in the, that were licensed uh, from Piers Anthony and Anne McCaffrey for the Crossroads series. Oh, wow. Then I wrote The Dragon Lover's Guide to Purden and The Visual Guide to Xanth. You wrote The Visual Guide to Xanth? Yep. Oh, my. OK, I'll let you finish your story. I, just, <laughs> and I went to like a first... person. I need to calm down. OK. <laughs> then uh, The Death of Sleep by uh, me and Anne McCaffrey came out within a month of my first solo fantasy novel, which was Mythology 101. Oh, wow. So wow. they were my seventh and eighth books, my actually first uh, first science fiction and fantasy novels. That is, um, oh my gosh, I'm like so jealous of the people, you know, it's funny. I actually talked to Piers Anthony and said, do you want to be on the show? And he's like, if you bring all the equipment to me, I'll be on the show. We're in Florida. And so okay. I said, okay, we'll wait for COVID to be, of course, we didn't anticipate it being the way it is right now, you know. No, I they, mean, month nine. Yeah. So he said he'd be on the show, but that's actually what got me interested in sci-fi and fantasy was um, The Veil of the Vole, his first okay. that book. I love that book. And then I saw your visual, I have your visual guide. Oh my okay. goodness. I don't know why I didn't even draw that correlation, but I still have it. It's one of my prized possessions. See, now next time I'm at Dragon Con, I'm going to be like dorky person that's like, will you sign my visual Yes, guide? of course I will. <laughs> Todd Hamilton, who is the artist, uh, is, a, is an old friend. And in fact, I just heard from him last week. So oh. he's, uh, he was so good. The, we all traveled down to meet with peers and talk to him and ask him what people looked like. And Todd did, uh, Todd also did the illustrations for the uh, visual guide to Castle Amber. 
So uh, in, in, my, in my craft room, with, which has all of my knitting and painting and sewing and, and uh, calligraphy stuff, uh, is the portrait of Gerard from that book. Oh, wow. And he, he uh, but the Dragon Lover's Guide to Pern, I have a few illustrations and I'm on page 75, a picture of me in, in Fort Weir garb, no, Fort Hold garb. Oh, because, uh, well, so now I'm gonna check amazing. all this out. Like I'm, my entire nerd brain is exploding right now and I'm <laughs> loving it. So you, I mean, it sounds like you've had such, did you want to be a writer? Like when you, I, you know, as you get older and I know you're telling me you did all these stories, but sometimes life hits you differently. We've talked to so many people that went to school to be a biologist or an ast astronomer, or like all these things were, and then they're like, yeah, but then I ended up being a writer. You know? <laughs> I, I talked to my friends who, who went to law school and, and uh, became physicists and still they were writers. Like, uh, like David Brin and uh, David Drake and a whole lot of people called Dave. But I, uh, when I was a kid, I thought about being an astronaut. I thought about, um, I, I didn't have any, any clear things, but I loved, I loved making people laugh. And I, I was always writing. So that, that was never a question. It was kind of part of, part of the wallpaper it was always there. But I went to school to uh, get into film. I wanted to, oh. I wanted to direct movies, but uh, it turned out that there are so many moving parts and I'm an introvert. Oh. So you have to be, you have to be a very uh, outgoing and forceful person in order to direct films. And you, getting, getting anywhere in Hollywood is complicated. My dad's cousin, Howard Zeep was a film director. Mm -hmm. And I know that he was very shy and his nieces, my other cousins, we're giving him assertiveness lessons on how to deal with some of the people he was working with uh, in, on one of his movies. So I know that I would have as much trouble as he did. <laughs> so I get to direct movies in my head and uh, instead of having, films are so collaborative. Films have thousands of people working on them. If you watch the, the end credits for any Marvel movie, they're, the names, they're thousands of names. Oh yeah. yeah. So you make compromises in everything. You make compromises with the producer on how much money they can raise. You make compromises with, say, if you want a star, uh, he or she may not want to be shot from his or her left. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of culture in there that uh, I, I would find uncomfortable. So as a, as a book writer, as a short story writer, I get to be the entire production crew and do everything that I want to without having to compromise my vision at all. You know, I, I deal with my editor, but usually we agree. And if they point something out, they're almost always right about where I, where I went wrong. <laughs> uh, Vanessa's an editor, so she loves that you oh, say this. This is cool. a conversation yeah. we cannot have enough with newer writers. I don't want to say young writers. I want to say newer writers is that they don't get the importance of somebody else who's trained looking at your work and going, yes. this is super cute, but whatever you were trying to say here is not, nobody is understanding what you're saying. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's good to have an extra pair of eyes on it. When I go over my students' work, I point out to them, I am the last person who is going to read your work all the way through mm -hmm. because oh. editors not necessarily will. Uh, Roger Moore, who used to edit Dragon Magazine, explained it to me thus, and I have passed this on to students, is he is not paid to read stories he's not going to buy. Mm. If he makes a judgment that this is not for him, it gets sent back, you know, with, with thanks. But he, he, can't, uh, he can't just sit and give critiques to people whose work he's not going to put in the magazine. He doesn't have the time. No, I, too busy. I, I, you are so right, because you know, at least was we're in, you know, we have Four Horsemen Publications and, you know, we have, you know, me and the other editor, we have control over which projects we want to work on because mm -hmm. if, you know, if it requires so much work, it's very difficult to be able to really hone into the part, you know, the skill sets that we have to really tighten up, you know, prose. And so when we go out of our way to go in and do edits for an entire novel short story you know it's really difficult if the author doesn't understand that you know we are a team like our goal is to help 
you know, reach you closer to your goal because you as the author know the whole scope of the world. The reader doesn't. And if it doesn't mm-hmm. translate in a very clear format, yes, you know what you are intending to, but the reader doesn't. And you know, oh, yeah. that's our goal. We're not the enemy. We are just wanting your vision to be crystal clear and perfect for your readers. Mm-hmm. I think that's that's a very good thing to express to them also. I've always found that editors are my allies. The, the enemy is the marketing department. <laughs> <laughs> Wish I hadn't taken a drink right before you. Oh, said. I am sorry. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's so funny you say that though, because you know, looking back on even um, some of the the great films and some great novels too, the, I, I agree with you a thousand percent. Like Princess Bride was marketed horribly as a film. Yeah, like that's one of my favorite. It's probably one of all of our favorite films of all time, right? Mm-hmm. And they did so terribly with bringing it to the public. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that is true. The, the wrong marketing can destroy what is otherwise a wonderful movie or a mov- wonderful book. Mm-hmm. And it can, in many cases, it can't recover. You can't, you can't get that spark back. And, and people say, oh, that old thing. Uh, it, can be, it can be fatal to marketing to have the wrong cover on a book. Yes. Uh, the Doomsday yes. Book by Connie Willis got this uh, fa- little fairy tale cover. It was all white except for an inset of, of a fairy tale castle that looked like the Disney Princess Castle. And it really is a, po- a post apocalyptic story. <laughs> and Con- yeah. <laughs> and a lot of parents bought it for their daughters based upon the cover painting. <laughs> oh, and it's amazing to me how people don't value the cover and cover artists. Like, I love that. You talked about going down and meeting with Pierce Anthony and having him explain what the people look like, because I don't think they have to match perfectly. Like, you mm-hmm. know, but again, if you're looking at a book, because everybody's like, what is it? Somebody said yesterday, never judge a book by its cover. And I'm like, every single book is judged by its cover. What the hell are you talking about? Yeah. I mean, I think the only exception to that rule is I've bypassed books because of their cover. And it was only word of mouth that forced me to read it. And then at that point, I loved the book. And then I realized, what were they thinking with the cover? Because it didn't justify what I read. So, you know, covers and word of mouth are like probably the most two important pieces in, in selling a book. Really. The perfect cover is the one that will attract the readers who will enjoy the book to it. Yes. And matching those up. Is, is the work of a gifted art director and a publisher who understands that sometimes you have to pay good money for the right artist. There's a whole concept there. Right. Yes, secondary to the marketers is the publishers and going, hey, you're gonna have to spend a little bit to get this book to go. That mm-hmm. would be nice of you. Right. <laughs> They're reluctant to do that. They would rather uh, put out as little as possible and make the author do the work. Mm. Here, go promote this. Mm-hmm. It, it, we, we talk about that constantly because yeah. you know it, it's interesting um we were talking to carrie vaughn and she said something that i did, i hadn't thought about but i'm i would love your thoughts on it is that for a sci-fi and fantasy author like now publishers give you one book and if you don't make it in that one book to build your audience they get kind of done like they don't give you the three book deals anymore and she was talking about how she feels especially for sci-fi fantasy, you have to have that three book build up your audience yeah. situation. Yeah. It's really funny. She's, she, she's correct, but uh, there's, there's logic behind it that you would just hate. And that is every uh, publisher wants standalone books, but they want to able to be expanded if they do well. Oh, was it? What's the thing in the query letters? A sta- it stands alone, but has series potential, and that's like. Yes. But then I, I find that so interesting because I've even heard literary agents hate that line. So it's like, what? What do you? Who? Who are you trying to serve? And it's mm-hmm. it's very difficult, you know, um, especially you know if you're a fantasy writer, sci-fi uh, writer, because you have, you know, this massive world secondary world for the most part that you're creating and mm-hmm. it, 
it requires more than one book to tell the story. And it doesn't really kind of close up very nicely in one book either. Well, when, when you're doing world building and you're pro uh, proposing that first novel, you really need to have done all of the homework to build that world for the first book. Mm -hmm. And then more of it comes out in the subsequent volumes. But you need to have laid the groundwork for all of the things you're going to introduce. Because if you don't, then things look pasted on. Mm -hmm. I love that you said that, Vanessa, because I said that to her yesterday. <laughs> Not as eloquently as you just did, but I'm like, you better have all this stuff laid out because nobody's going to get it if you don't. Yeah, because I write epic fantasy and I've been, uh, the current project I'm working on, uh, I, is, I'm putting too much in it, into it, the first one. Mm -hmm. And it, and the point is I need to pull back some of it and just like finish out the one storyline, even though obviously there's an undercurrent major arcing story, but like get to the gist of what I'm trying to say in the first one before I expand further on. Yeah, well, um, uh you don't reveal everything, but you need to have thought about it. Right. Yes. Right. No, I agree. So where did you, where do you get your inspiration? You sound like probably you have one of the most epic imaginations if the rest of us besides reading your books can crawl into your imagination and play around. Where do you find you get a lot of inspiration from? Oh boy. Uh, everywhere, as, as, as you might guess. I pick up all sorts of really weird little facts and they they sometimes are you know they make you hmm well okay what if and then you suddenly ask because conflict uh, is where you get story what if something went terribly wrong mm -hmm. i i read the science news a lot and i i am just fascinated by everything that they're discovering one thing after another after another and the, the joys of knowing our world is bigger and more complicated than we ever dreamed and what, what can I do with that? Or in the case of a fantasy, uh, perhaps playing with an idea that I thought about years ago or uh, saw approached in a different way in another fantasy novel, I'd say, that's cool, but here's my take on it. And this, this is what I would do in a similar situation, not copying somebody, but, but riffing off on where they began. Mm -hmm. Uh, I read a lot of mythology and a lot of uh, legends, and they they lend themselves well to to picking up or at least uh, exploring the 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 basis from which they sprang. The the, the heroes that came out of, of a terrible poverty. The the um, the story of the golem oh, putting yeah. putting the 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 clay giant. Uh, a hero, a, a servant to the Jews who are trapped in the, in the ghettos of Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. And that, that came out of the situation, that, that grew out of the situation of, we feel terribly powerless, how can we create power for us? Uh, or, uh, or Icarus saying, birds fly, why can't I? Icarus and Daedalus. So, you know, riffing off that, picking it up, I, I did a review for a fellow who's, um, the, the first book was called Zeus is Dead. A, a, uh, I'm trying to remember the, the subhead of it. It was a monstrous something. And he knows Greek mythology backwards and forwards. Uh, he, he knows so much about it that, that he is writing from that very deep knowledge. And it's extremely funny. Oh, wow. It, it's really funny. And I wrote, I wrote a, uh, a blurb for him that said, um, Michael Munz, that's his name. Hi, Mike. Uh, takes an idea and runs with it like a toddler with his, with his mom's smartphone. <laughs> hmm. And that's, that's probably my best blurb to date. And I am very proud of it. He, uh, but, but somebody who has an idea like that, he's, he's riffing off old Greek mythology, which he has been obviously reading for years and saying, why has no one ever talked about this or the complicated uh, love lives and parental uh, uh, trees of descent of the gods? Because sometimes the Titans are the sisters and brothers of those on Mount Olympus and sometimes they're their parents and, and family reunions get really complicated. 
That is so true. So that any is... anything I read is probably uh, food for literature later on. Do you talk to um like you say you read scientists? Do you, I'm assuming um I'm I shouldn't assume actually that's terrible. But do you get the opportunity to meet with and talk to scientists if you built yourself up a collective of friends to call and go? Let me talk about floating cars for a minute. Like, <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, Bain Books, the main publisher that I work for these days, has several people who work for NASA writing for them. And oh. I have two young adult books written with Travis Taylor, who is uh, not only a scientist, but a, a TV personality. If you have seen Rocket City Rednecks or the Tesla Files or Three Scientists Walk Into a Bar, the guy with the blonde hair and the muscles is him. Oh, wow, yes. And he's, he's a lot of fun. He's got a great sense of humor. And we had huge fun coming up with, with the novels that we wrote. The science is accurate. It's the, the extrapolation is that we don't yet have a colony on the moon, but we hope someday. Mm -hmm. And then those, then those stories could take place. Uh, no, I love that. I, I love that. Okay, I have a couple more research questions, but we have to take a quick bake. bake. <laughs> break we will be right back with drinking with authors sample locally sourced quality distilled spirits in the beautiful columbia river gorge at skunk brothers distillery we're family owned brewing small batch grain to bottle spirits just like our grandfather did back in the prohibition era from handcrafted bourbons and moonshine to flavored blends and cordials infused with local fruit Join us for a tasting tour and buy Skunk Brothers Spirits straight from the source. It's all in the family at Skunk Brothers Spirits, located in Stevenson, Washington. We're back. We're back with Drinking With Authors. Okay. I want to talk about the fact that you have had a lot of collaborations. And this is a skill not every author, I actually think very few authors can do. And I want you to talk a little bit about that because... Even from the beginning, it seems like you've had collaborations and you hear people doing it, but how's that going? How did that start? Well, probably the first uh, collaborations that I did were uh, the fact that I was writing in other people's universes, which is a form of collaboration. I had to please their readers without any uh, any side-by-side -side input from them. Mm -hmm. Then I was also working on short stories for The Fleet, which was a shared world anthology edited by David Drake and Bill Fawcett. Oh, wow. So um, Bill had created, Bill is a book packager as well as a writer, a game designer, an editor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, won't fit on one business card. And he had created a couple of collaboration projects for David Drake and CJ Cherry to write each with three junior authors in a uh, in an epic, oh. I, think that, I think he did those for Harper or New American Library. I'm not. I, I can't remember after all these years. It's been it's been a long, long time. And he asked Anne McCaffrey if she would participate in this as well because she had been comfortable with having us do the uh, choose your own adventures and the Dragon Lovers Guide. He wanted to see if there was one of her projects that she didn't have time to do herself, but to work with. The, with junior authors. Okay. And she said uh, at the time she had promised Judy Lynn Del Rey she would never work for another editor, another uh, publishing house while Judy Lynn was alive for Del Rey. Oh. And uh, Judy unfortunately left us and Anne, uh, we, we waited a decent amount of time then said, well, and she said, okay. <laughs> it, was, uh, it, was, it was a huge privilege to work with her. She was so, so generous. And there were three of us. We were working with Anne on the outlines and I took my outline. I wrote the first draft, handed it over to Anne. She went over it, uh, gave it back to me and I went over it. Then she had her eyes on it last before it went to the publisher. Mm -hmm. So okay. she, would, she would put in things like write, write fight scene here. Uh, and I, I would write back, um, write diplomatic scene here. <laughs> and she was also enormously generous in that if, if I came up with an idea for something that was for the same scene as she was writing something, if she liked my idea better, she would use it without any question, without uh, trying to make me feel guilty about it. She felt so confident in herself that she was able to give up her own ideas for her junior writer if she liked them. Wow. 
That is awesome. She, she was, she was wonderful. Uh, I worked on that particular trio. It was the Planet Pirate series with uh, Anne and Elizabeth Moon, who was the other junior writer on the project. Oh, wow. Yeah. And Elizabeth and I have become good friends. She's, she's a tremendously wonderful writer, but it was, uh, we were, we were very much, much earlier in our, in our careers than, than we are now. So Anne was, Anne was the, the guiding light, the big boss, what she said went. Oh, wow. She, she used her power with kindness and wisdom. I think that's amazing. Cause I think, um, when you're, when you're talking about sharing and being able to collaborate, it is being able to sort of let go and go, wait, that is better. I think that's true in anything that you have to be able to go, what's better. It's, it's, it's funny to me, it ties back to something I learned in gaming. I can't play a game where there isn't a leader of some kind in the game. I don't have to be the leader, mm -hmm. but there's gotta be somebody kind of driving the overall situation. Otherwise it's pretty chaotic to me. And when you say, okay, this person's gonna do this, you gotta win, even if they make a decision that you're like, what are you doing? You gotta go, well, I let them be the leader. Like <laughs> every, every collaboration is different. Um, Anne was the first big name that I worked with. Mm -hmm. And of course her, her her word was law. If she didn't like something out, it went. If she wanted more of something, it came. But when you are working with as a peer, you have to have to set ground rules and they are, it's necessary to make them up before you start the project and say, whose eyes are going to be on this last? Whose vision of the characters uh, is the one that take that holds sway? And who is going to write what portions. I know people who split it up, heroes and villains, um, uh, main character and sidekick, uh, sometimes line by line, chapter by chapter, whatever division works for you. Yeah, I and actually, there I are there are people who have greater understanding of certain characters than than their partner does. And so they should be the one whose whose vision is, is correct on that. And the other one should not argue, but that's not a given either. But the the main thing, if you are working with someone else, is you have to respect them. You don't have to like them. There there is a, a notable pairing in science fiction uh, who went through a period of time when they did not talk to each other, but they were still had contracts. So they sent their things up and back. They respected each other, but at the at that time there was uh, some some ar angst going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I actually am going to co-write uh, a series with uh, another one of our writers, uh, Valerie Willis, and ours is called The Brothers Nine. And it was really interesting because with collaborating with her, I knew she was perfect for me because it didn't feel difficult. Like, we just knew what each other's strengths and weaknesses are. Mm -hmm. And anytime someone felt really strongly about, oh, this is the specific character cork, or this is the direction, I always trust, I've always trusted her because I love her, her individual work. So mm -hmm. I never felt that she, even if it wasn't something that I didn't immediately think like, oh yeah, that's where I would go. I trusted her. And I think that also is super important in collaborations. You have to trust each other. It to know that they are capable of writing fantastic work. And, you know, and we had nine characters that we split up. And it, it, it was funny because we actually gravitated naturally to, she gravitated naturally to three, I grad, gravitated to three others. And then there was one that her and I decided that we were just gonna split in half on, you know, writing from their perspective. So it was really funny how that kind of division worked out, but I don't know. I think to in any collaboration, rules are the most important, but also it's you have to be a fan of the other person's work that you're working with. Yeah. I, I would feel. And you have to each be willing to do a hundred percent of the work. Exactly. Mm -hmm. There things happen. I've had a collaborator die on me. So uh, Oh gosh. Yeah. Oh, wow. So the and, and I had nothing to do with it. I promise you. I was going to say, did you just <laughs> no, not? Like I didn't them do it. I, I was like, it. that's one way to solve a collaboration problem. <laughs> well, I, I did have somebody who uh, I was starting to work with, and that person turned into a control freak the moment we agreed to do something, and became very manipulative and very bossy. Mm. Not at all the person that I thought I had been dealing with. Mm. Interesting. So that, 
the project never happened and I'm sorry about that. No, don't be sorry. It's better yeah. to know that up front and, mm -hmm. and let it go and know that it wasn't meant to be and put that energy time towards something else. You know, don't force, I don't think those are the type of relationships you can really force. It's either you're good with working with that person or you're not, you know, and mm -hmm. I, if it doesn't come naturally in some sense, I, I wouldn't put too much, you know, effort into it. I would always rather have the friendship than the project. Another project is going to come along tomorrow. I'll come up with something before I finish talking to the person and saying, you know what, this isn't working. Let's go out to dinner. <laughs> I love that. I agree to that. <laughs> so you write humor, which I don't think a lot of people realize. Humor is probably one of the hardest things to write. Humor by far is, it, and I say this because I actually feel this is true in a lot of different mediums. Like humor is way harder to me than a drama scene. Crying the whole thing, you can totally, you can, it's easier to make people cry than it is to make them laugh. Oh, I agree. I agree. Yeah. It, just, it does come naturally to me. I have, uh, I have been privileged to know some other writers who are tremendously funny. I've known an equal number of them. I actually have known an overwhelming number of them who think they're funny and aren't. Uh, <laughs> but there are some wonderful wits out there mm -hmm. and it's just a joy to come across something where where you you get you get that sort of anticipatory grin on your face and say oh this is going to be good <laughs> oh yes and then you come to the punchline and it was worth it mm -hmm. oh my goodness when you talk about you we talked about earlier about you teaching do you find it easy to teach authors how to do humor do you teach authors how to do humor I can talk about humor. I can't make someone funny who isn't, but I can help them draw it out. There are, there are ways to approach humor. There are ways to approach humor in print that don't work uh, in, in visual, in, uh, in spoken, and vice versa, because you have dramatic pauses, you have gestures, you have shtick, uh, you have business that you can perform when you're doing something in person or in a visual medium. With print, we have to be rather more careful and, and unfortunately a little more obvious. Although I have been known to throw in subtle jokes that if one person out of a thousand gets it or somebody writes to me and said, I saw what you did there, it, it makes my day because I was gonna throw it in anyhow. And if nobody ever saw it, I still know I put it in there. But we use dramatic pauses, we use ellipses, we use exclamation points, we paragraph in order to make an emphasis on something and we can do it. We can create the sort of uh, timing that you would have if you were telling a joke on stage. So oh, exactly. I have to I figure them out. That is a mystical, like totally a mystical ability for writers. And anyone mm -hmm. who could do it, I, I have such a profound respect for. I think we were talking earlier about Pierce Anthony. That was one of the things that got me when I started reading the Zant series mm -hmm. is man him and his puns like there are not a lot of authors out there that have the, the the pun ability to make it genuinely funny well spider robinson and harry turtledove terrible punsters uh i'm proud to know them if if, if it makes you groan and want to run out of the room it was probably pretty good <laughs> but, but the really important thing about any humorous story is that What's going on in the story is very important to the people who are in it. We find it funny, but they don't. They, they, this is just their life. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's so true. When, you, when you're talking about your fans, you, you definitely go into conventions and stuff. I, I was talking to, um, when we were talking to Paul Cornell, he was saying, I told him, I said, you need to go to Dragon Con and have like a booth. Like you need to be, or do the author track where people can actually know you're there to come up and meet you. Cause he just goes to kind of hang out and do panels sometimes. And I'm like, that's not always easy for your fans to find a place to come and sit and talk to you or, you know, bring something for you to sign. Like you, you sort of have to, that's the marketing. Anyway, needless to say, he'll, he, if Dragon Con's happening um, next year, he wants to be part of it and in person, he likes the in-person events. Tell him to apply. It has an online application. Everybody has to fill out the application. Go oh, I'm telling, I, 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 told, I said, <laughs> I'm not gonna do, I'm gonna find out how you do this and I'll email you. <laughs> so 
let's talk about meeting your fans. When was your first fan interaction? You went to all the very junior nerd cons. Did you have somebody come up to go, I loved your module, let's talk about this? Uh, my first signing of my, uh, that I went, I went to our local uh, B, Barnes and Noble, no, excuse me. No, it wasn't, it was a B Dalton. And I signed books there. I think it was a different store, <laughs> Waldick Books. Yes, it was, uh, yeah. <laughs> back, back along when, when it still existed. Yeah. And I signed books there and the lady was just thrilled to meet an, an author. So it, it didn't matter that it was me, it could have been anybody. But it was that was that was a lot of fun. I went to the Worldcon that year, and I had two people come to have me sign their books, and they were very enthusiastic about it, which I thought was incredibly sweet. And then uh, I and Jerry Olshan and the other people at the table, who uh, Jerry Jerry had a wonderful term. The reason I mentioned him is LKP, little known pros. Oh, so we were we were LKPs. And after we each signed the two books or two short stories that people had brought for us, we got to watch Larry Niven sign books for an hour. <laughs> but so, that's got to have changed for you now when you go, correct? Uh, yeah, it, it depends. It dep you know, naturally, if you have something fresh out, you got get lots more people than if you are coming to a con and uh, they, they already have what you've got. Um, and, and sometimes they just want to come by and chat, which is great. Nothing is worse than having to sit there playing with your pen and trying to look perky when no, everybody is going past you. And it, it does depend on getting things out there. But if someone wants to come and chat with me, please do. I love it. Have you but, had people dress as your characters? It, no, 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 no. I dress as me. I want people not to you dressing in your characters. I mean, people coming up to the table cosplaying oh, your character. Yeah. Only once have I had someone cosplay one of my characters, and I was thrilled to pieces. My friend's younger brother dressed up as Lord Thomas Kanaga, who is the, the hero of my uh, Imperium series with Bane Books. And he was just perfect for it because Thomas is very handsome, and James is very handsome and playful. So uh, James was doing card tricks, which is something exactly Thomas would do to try and get people uh, amused because he loves to amuse people. So he's, he's the only one who's done that so far. I have had a whole group come up dressed as the Myth Adventures crew that was started by Robert Asprin, continued by the two of us and me continuing since Bob passed away. Uh, but that, that is really the only time so far. That's got to be, I, I feel like that's one of those moments, like you almost as an author for yourself, you end up with this checklist of, I know I made it when these things occur, right? And to me, that's got to be one of those moments. I want somebody to show up at a table one time. I should be careful saying this now that I think. <laughs> you write about serial killers, Eric. I do. I don't know how I feel about them cosplaying coming to your table. I was just, I stopped myself. I was like, that would be, wait, wait. <laughs> Maybe inappropriate. Maybe don't <laughs> right. we, we, joke, we joke that you know you've made it as a writer when you get a bad blurb. When the back of your when the description on the back of your book does not match the the, the book. Yeah, oh, it's very generic, right? Like you know something that seems like you're kind of separated from it, kind of. No, it can it can be worse than that. Uh, we have a copy of Dragonflight by Anne McCaffrey, and on the back it said. Uh, the situation pits the virtuous Lessa against the dread dragon riders. No. I, I can I can probably still find that that volume downstairs in our in our library. It's uh <laughs> Anne, Anne just just sort of laughed. She had a big hearty laugh and and said they didn't obviously didn't read the book. They probably glanced at a couple of pages. They looked at the beginning, which is when Lessa is afraid of dragon riders. But that, that goes away very, very quickly. So obviously they didn't get past like page four. <laughs> Do you control your own blurbs? Do you have a lot of input on the blurbs on your book these days? Depends on the publisher. Uh, Bain likes, likes you to write your own blurb because you know what's in the book and you aren't going to give away what's in it. I have had uh, situations where the blurb on the back completely gave away the mystery Wow. So I had I would have to go hat, uh, hat in hand to the editor and say they can't do this. 
They, they really can't. They, they, this happens on page 311. Please make them stop. Yeah. That's, that's like putting on the back of the Harry Potter book. So Dumbledore is going to die in this book. And blah. <laughs> right. Do you, have you been traditionally published the entire time? Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. I have, uh, I have an anthology, well, a collection of, of short stories that I uh, put out on my own because it was put together for a story bundle, storybundle.com uh, for Jason Chen. And after that was all done, I said, why isn't this uh, a book now that it's all done? And it has a cover because uh, a friend of mine was kind enough to let me use a piece of art. So that's uh, actually now, uh, what's the name of the press now? It's uh, Prince of Cats has put out Cats Triumphant for me that was always meant to be a, uh, a print anthology, a print collection, as well as uh, an online one. It sold as an online one for a few years, but it's, it's now finally in paper. Then, uh, then I had another collection in, in story bundle of, uh, of strong women characters, witches, wizards, warriors, and so on. And I also have small press publications. Uh, Wordfire Press has been very generous to me and I have a couple of things with them. So it's, it's mostly traditional publications, but I have dipped into small press and the st short story collections were just a natural. So, but mostly, I think it's a great thing for, for young writers to be able to publish something of, of their own, but I really do caution them to talk to an editor, to pay an editor to go over it. <laughs> and if We're nothing else, talk, as you're talking. Copy it, copy it. <laughs> but also say, you know, this, this, this doesn't make sense. Here's, here's my take on it. It's your story, of course, but here's where I lose the plot. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You've been educating writers for a while. Do you find a lot of people come to you asking for you outside of your lessons and your, um, uh, yeah. basically your, uh, I cannot believe, you know, I can't believe I'm not remembering the word, but you have <laughs> workshops. Thank you. Yes. That, um, it's fine. Angry Orchard. It's a friend, um, that you go to do you find a lot of people come and want you to read their books? How do you react to that when they do that? I honestly, truly don't have time to do it. So I have to tell them the truth. Right now it's, it's been really complicated. Uh, my, my father passed away two months ago and we've been trying to deal with all the things with that. And it's, it's, been, it's been a time sink on top of being being you know, devastated about losing my dad. Our condolences. Yeah. Thank you, that's kind. Um, so if somebody wants me to read their book, I, I just, I really can't. I, I'm, I'm very sorry, I wish I could help. I, sometimes even my past students have said, please, can you read this for me? You know, you've seen it before. And I would very much love to, but I, I, I've, got to, I've got to get the work done that I can while I'm doing it and deal with the other situations in my life alongside it. And, and complications like this are very hard on your creativity, okay. not to mention what is happening to practically every creative I know, thanks to the COVID and everything else. The, an article I read called it allostatic load. When there's just a nonstop situation, it, it it preys on you. It's, it sucks the energy that you would otherwise be you using for being creative. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's interesting because talking to a lot of authors, especially ones that don't get to do this full time, right? You get to be a full time, mm -hmm. along with everything you're doing. I'm not just saying you're only an author, but you're a, a full time author. You're a writer. And, I am a full time writer. Yeah, this yeah. is my job. Yes. And uh, we, you know, the whole COVID situation, I think, has been very different because we you have people that are like if I just had time if I just had the schedule you know what I mean and it's presented but it's presented with what I feel like is almost like a soaking wet blanket on top of it that's so heavy yes that you, it's not it's not the freedom that you need almost to create now some people have managed to persevere writing wise through this we've talked to a few but the majority that's not the case you know, it's it not very, very hard. Experience. Yeah, it, it's terribly hard on people. 
in in a normal situation, if if when this is over, like like it was before, um, we have we have advised people who say, oh, I don't have the time to write. Set a kitchen timer, 15 minutes. Write whatever you can in that 15 minutes, and be thinking about it during the rest of your day, while you're brushing your teeth, while you're feeding your kids, while you're going to your job. 15 minutes, nothing else, no commitment more. There's all, also the possibility of uh, doing it one sheet of paper. Fill up one sheet of paper a day, be anticipating that. And if you do one sheet of paper a day, which is approximately 250 words, by the end of the year, you'll have 90,000 words, which is about the length of a novel. Mm -hmm. So if you can write one page a day, you'll, you, can have, you can write a book a year. And that's not a bad way to go. No, not at all. And it's when you put it in perspective like that, it changes it because the 90,000 words can be very daunting until you go, this is how you break it down. This is how right. you keep it accountable. Um, what is your, do you still, because you talked about your girlfriend grabbing the notepad off your back seat and looking at what you were doing. Um, do you still, how do you take your notes now when you, you're sitting there and you go, you know what, I have a great idea. How do you take your notes now? Oh, on, on my computer, I have a, a whole folder full of little ideas. And in fact, I have a place on my phone where I jot down notes that I have come up with. You too? Yes. Yeah. Memo pad on iPhone is, I dictate to it. Obviously not while driving, never do that. Actually, um, but if I'm, yeah, but if I'm walking somewhere, I've done it in a doctor, between like doctor's appointments. Um, you know, if I'm at the you know, where if you're waiting somewhere and it's really mundane, I'll just sit there and just make a couple notes and, mm -hmm. and you feel like you did something at least for the day. I had a mini recorder for, for a long time before uh, the iPhone was kind enough to provide me with, with a microphone and, and a recording device. Mm -hmm. I did that because I used to try and make notes while I was driving in my car and that way it leads to, uh, leads to car accidents. So I stopped mm -hmm. doing that. And the, the little tape recorder was, was a good idea. Um, Diane Duane actually put me onto that. She has one she calls Chatterbox, mm. and I call mine Little Sir Echo. So uh, I don't have to use Little Sir Echo anymore because I've got the iPhone. But it, it served me well for a long time. Yeah, I do that with the iPhone. I, mine are all um, not type notes. They're all me talking into it. Okay. Sometimes I wonder what I was thinking, but I I do go back to them quite a bit actually. Because mm -hmm. I think of dialogue or I think of um, plot twists. It's not always story ideas, but sometimes I'll think of a really great line and I'm like, some character eventually needs to say this. Blah. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, if you download Evernote on your iPhone or I have or Evernote. whatever. Yeah. And Evernote, Evernote's great because it, it basically syncs up to what's online. So you can go in onto your onto your web browser copy and paste it and plug it into your Word document. So it makes it like super easy to, you know, uh, save all that information. I haven't tried that yet. That's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah, I just transcribe it because when I transcribe it, I add things. Mm. No, that's, that, I think that's brilliant. When you're writing, um, where do you write? Does it have to be quiet? Do you need music? Like, what is your writing environment like and has it evolved? Well, I used to uh, have a have my Apple IIe, before that an Apple IIc in the corner. I had, of the those. I had a Commodore 64. Oh my goodness, okay. Yeah. Yeah, oh, cool. portable I never computer. It, but I had it. Uh, sit, sit there and stare at the screen, but I'm, I work on a laptop mostly now. And uh, I've had a succession of uh, ultralights over the years. As they fail, I get the next one. And always, 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 friends and neighbors, back up your manuscripts, back up your work. Mm -hmm. Thumb drive I, is your friend. You know, we have, we have lots of them in the house. <laughs> yes. I love the cloud now. The cloud is make me so happy for places that you can store stuff. I'm like, yes, please, for when crap breaks or goes missing or whatever. I always do thumb drives, one drive, and then I also will every so often email it to myself. And mm -hmm. it's better to have multiple ways of doing having it like saved than to have that one time it craps out and you just like lost your life's work. It's 
would be yes. devastating. And, and I, I know somebody who, who hit delete on a huge manuscript and tried to do everything to get it back. And this was in the days before uh, hard drives. Mm -hmm. It was gone. Yeah. It was, that's just, my, my heart breaks. And I, I know people who've lost their only copy because they didn't back up their work. I have, uh, I use Dropbox too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But make sure it's in more than one place because stuff happens. House fires happen. This is why the cloud, uh, computers poop out. That's why the thumb drive and so on. Hard drives burn out. I've had, I've heard of people losing because they only had it on a hard drive mm -hmm. and it, it, it crapped out. So and pay, and pay for a peripheral drive. One terabyte costs what a 256 K one did mm -hmm. 10 years ago. It's oh, astonishing yeah. how cheap memory is getting. Mm -hmm. a, a, do, you, do you listen to, can you write in public? So this is something that's yes, I can. Yeah. I don't, I don't listen to music when I'm working. I don't watch TV while I'm working. Uh, I don't look at my email at all before noon because my best productivity is in the morning. I, I talked to Kevin Anderson about this. In fact, uh, we, we were on a panel together and I said, this is, this is probably my greatest productivity thing. I don't answer email in the morning because otherwise that's all I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. And he said, I never thought of that. So I, he may be doing that now, but it's a good thing to have a dedicated time where you do not have external distractions of anything. Of course, I have cats, so <laughs> that's that's going to happen no matter what. I was so going to say that keep them as an external distraction. Yes. If they Hello. walk across the keyboard and are <laughs> they don't because it's a laptop, but they will snuggle up next to me, uh, or they'll stand on the arm of of the sofa because. Every, every, every book wants to be written in a place. And one book that uh, I had been trying to work in my usual spot and the book kept saying, no, 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 go, go in the other room, sit on that couch, sit on that couch. That's where, that's where we're gonna do this. And I found that, okay, you, you go where the work wants to be done. Wow, do you have a, a story graveyard? Do you have a place where the that you've stored the stories that just are like this is not going where now nope, I'm going to put it in my story graveyard for right now. Some people call it, you know, their the research points, but I was, you know, it's the place where the stories go that didn't finish themselves. Yes, because there are always ideas that are unfinished. They have they're they're not going anywhere. They don't have a purpose. Uh, I had a, a wonderful scene that it was just beautiful that didn't fit into the story I was writing it for. So I took it out. I performed a, 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 a scenectomy and <laughs> I put it uh, into a file. And a couple of years later, I was writing a story and I had this speaking mind that said, you know what, you have this perfectly wonderful little scene with gorgeous description in your odd bits of silliness file, go get it. And I did. So it got used. Uh, when somebody says, do you have a story about blah? You know, cause I'm looking for this and, and I'll sometimes look through that file and say, oh yeah, right. I, I've been doing this ever since I was doing it on paper. I have a file uh, in, in my uh, file, file cabinet called story seeds of just ideas that I threw off when I had, had the opportunity to write the details down but not time to write the story. So you go back some of them, to that some of them I've resurrected, some of them I haven't. How do you feel looking back at your previous work? Because we all get better. We know that. that well, 99.999% <laughs> of us as writers get better. Um, as time goes on, what do you think when you're looking back at your original stuff? I like it. I, yes, uh, I've matured and I, I did things that I would never do again. Anne McCaffrey broke me of the habit of wasing. When you have too many uh, iterations of the verb to be all over the place, especially starting sentences with it was, he was, I was. Um, and that was one of the greatest things she did for me. I try to break my students of it. It is incredibly annoying once you become aware of it. When you can count 57 was's on the first page, you know that there's a problem here and it probably isn't gonna get any better. I wasn't that bad. But it was something that I am glad that I learned how not, how not to do 
-hmm. what I what I tell my students generally if they if they find themselves stuck on was is make friends with your dynamic verbs. If you can do that, you'll find that you're walking away from was. You're walking away from to be. Uh, I think uh, I, I did good research for things. I, I created some characters that I still love. So I'm, I'm pretty well pleased with, with the things that I had. Do you I, know, I know some people hate their early work. I don't. No, well, I, you know, it's interesting when somebody tells me they hate their early work. What I find when I go back and read, I have nowhere near the library and breadth of work you do. So prefacing with that. But when I go back to something I wrote 10 years ago and I look at it, what I find myself doing is wanting to fix it. And so I have to, I had to break myself of the habit of going, oh my God, I could make this so much better. Cause I literally had to go, that was previous work on, you have all these ideas, work on something new because I will rewrite that story 5 million times. Cause <laughs> Well, I actually, it's a great way to test yourself or to kind of like give yourself more hope, especially if you're getting a lot of rejection. Because mm -hmm. I remember one year I had submitted um, one project to Pitch Wars, Author Mentor Match, which are these, pro, these different contests to submit your project to work with someone to be your mentor. Mm -hmm. They help you uh, you know, get it as cleaned and polished to get that ready for clearing. And I, I, one year I was rejected from two times from author match, author mentor match, one from pitch wars and another short story. And I gave my book to a friend and I was like, I don't know what to do, but please edit this. Help me give me a fresh perspective. She gave it back to me and I worked on it. And when I look back a year later, from what that was to when I had submitted it. Yes, I was rejected, but when I saw the, the level of growth in that yes. one year, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't be mad because it just showed that, yes, it wasn't my time to win that contest or to get an agent or to get, you know, whatever it is you're trying to achieve, but mm -hmm. you, you're still learning. You're still moving closer and closer to that goal. And it's not a failure. It's just a, a moment to kind of shake you up, to force you to switch your habits and do something different. Oh, absolutely. Kevin Anderson always talks about the 750 rejection slips that he had. Mm-hmm. And he, did he you used say to 750? 750, I did say that, yes. Wow, I thought That's Stephen King's 100 and whatever the hell he talks about on the nail all the time is terrible. Oh, he, he papered his bathroom with them as far as I, 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 I know. But uh, he, he talks about how he kept trying and trying and trying and, and finally matured his style, uh, matured his approach, figured out his market and succeeded wildly well. And he's incredibly prolific. We are both judges for the Writers of the Future contest. And you are allowed to submit every single quarter until you either uh, become a professional or you win. So it's, it's great. It'll, also, it is free, unlike most writing contests where they ask you for a 25 or $50 fee uh, for putting in your, your manuscript. So it's... Um, it's a great proving ground for, for young writers, for, for new writers, I should say. Yeah, I'm not going to make that mis <laughs> mistake. Oh, I, I say, I, I catch myself saying young, and I'm like, no, it's new, because people all over the map it, pick it up oh, when yeah. you finally get the chance to, or make the time for yourself to do that. But I How recommend it, I recommend it for people as a proving ground, because it gives you a deadline. You have to get it in by the last day of the quarter, mm -hmm. and... You, you might or might not get feedback uh, because they get thousands of manuscripts. But if you happen to make it to the finalists, uh, then, then you probably will get some feedback. And if you win, it has awesome prizes, including a week-long seminar led by David Farland and Tim Powers, mm -hmm. both very notable uh, fantasy and science fiction writers. And you hear from each and every one of the judges, including me and Tim uh, Rob Sawyer, Kevin Anderson, Rebecca Mesta, Nettie Okorafor, uh, Larry Niven. Oh, wow. So everybody gives them the, the benefit of their wisdom. Nina Kariki Hoffman does a terrific thing on, on plotting that I just was so tickled by that I thought it was so clever. And 
we become part of their peer group. So this is why I recommend it for beginning writers uh, to, to try because the prizes are really well worth having. Oh, wow. Well, that's good advice. And we're talking about it. We'll have to push that out on the show too. Mm -hmm. you know, the media, I should say the media on the show. Okay. We actually have to wrap up this episode. Um, what is the best way for fans? I mean, it's silly if they can't find you, but where do you recommend fans find you? Well, um, what, what, what with COVID uh, making things difficult, uh, my, my webmaster decided that it was time to update my website, but it will be back up and it's jodylindai.com or jodynai.net. But you can generally find me on Facebook, Jody Lynn Nye, all three names, three, three N's, three Y's. So, uh, so you know, find me. Awesome. I haven't been posting a lot lately, but I will be back. <laughs> <laughs> understandably understandably completely and it has been marvelous having you on the show thank you so much for coming on with us oh it's been such fun this is brilliant okay so this has been drinking with authors i've been your host erica lance and i'm vanessa valiente and we'll see you next time